Southwest, and we're going to start with the uh, Native Americans in the Southwest. Now, you can divide those tribes up primarily into two divisions. There was one group we called the Pueblo, which was made up primarily of the Navajo, the Hopi, and the Zuni tribes. Uh, they all were very agriculturally oriented. They lived in pueblos, uh, sun-dried brick homes, looked like almost like apartment houses. The other group that was present in the Southwest was the Apache. The Apache was completely different. And we're gonna talk about those in just a few moments. Uh, they occupied the areas of New Mexico and Arizona, as well as a little bit of Utah and Colorado and uh, some of Western Texas, even a little bit of California. Uh, here's a map which shows you the uh, approximate locations of the tribes. You can see it up here around the uh, little Colorado River, uh, up around where the Grand Canyon is. You can see the Hopi tribe was up here and the Navajo, basically in this area right here, and the Zuni were down in this area. Around the edges, uh, out into uh, Arizona, were several different branches of the Apache. You had the Jicarilla Apache, the Mescalero, uh, the Chiricahua, and then you had some lesser tribes, which uh, were, did not make up a whole lot of the, uh, of the Indian population of the Southwest. Uh, you know, I told you last week about a man by the name of Edward Curtis that took a lot of photos of the uh, Indian tribes in which we're indebted to. This is two of his uh, more famous photos. This is uh, something he called Navajo Man. And uh, you can see he's typically Navajo in a blanket and all. I love this photo because if any of you are out there are fans of Star Wars, it reminds me of Princess Leia, the way she has her hair up. Uh, and this was very typical of Hopi women. They wore their hair with these side buns like this. Okay, so what can we say about the Navajo and the Hopi and the Zuni? Well, first of all, they were agriculturally oriented, and that's rather ironic because they lived in a part of the West that was probably the least hospitable for agriculture or raising livestock, and yet that's exactly what they did. Uh, they grew corn, which we call maize, uh, squash, potatoes, melons, beans. They gave us all these uh, different vegetables uh, that were not present in Europe at the time that, uh, that we uh, first found them over in, out in the West. They also were herdsmen. They herded goat, cattle and goats and sheep and horses. And uh, as they were eventually added, as they came into their presence, usually from the Spanish, they got a lot of these from the Spanish, at least the cattle and the horses. Uh, they did live, uh, as I live in, as I said, adobe type buildings, uh, pueblos. Uh, they would look like apartment houses almost. And they were really prolific weavers and pottery makers. And some of this stuff is worth a whole lot of money today if you can happen to get your hands on some of the original stuff. For instance, uh, I don't know how many of out there are fans of Antiques Roadshow, but my wife and I love that show. And I remember this uh, session that was going on. I remember this guy brought this blanket in and he said that it was given to his, I believe his great grandmother by Kit Carson in Taos, New Mexico. And uh, it was handed down to him and he didn't think much about it. He said he thought it was kind of a ugly old white and black and blue blanket and uh, never thought much about it. In fact, the case he said the week before he brought it on the Antiques Roadshow, he was using it as a bed for his kit, his cat that was birthing kittens. His cat actually birthed kittens on this blanket before he brought it in. I'm assuming he had it cleaned or washed or something. Well, the guy that was appraising it, this man over here, was just absolutely in shock. And he said, what you have here is what's known as a first phase Navajo blanket, which is in, in excellent condition. He appraised it out at a half a million dollars. It eventually went to market on an auction. And this guy, the appraiser, actually ended up buying it. And it went for $2.3 million on public auction. So 
if you ever get your hands on the first phase Navajo blanket, uh, hang on to it. Well, at least hang on to it to get it sold. Let's put it that way. Okay. Uh, what kind of religious beliefs did the uh, Southwestern tribes have? Well, again, they were like most Indian tribes. They believed in a great creator. Uh, they worshiped nature. They were uh, what we call animistic tribes. Uh, and they believed that really what they needed to do was maintain an equilibrium in the world with themselves, keep everything in harmony, just like most of the other Indian tribes did. And uh, they thought that their role was to keep good hearts, to observe complex religious rituals, uh, most of them signifying the birth and the death of things in the world. So this was a, the religion was very important to them, just as it was in most Indian tribes. Again, most of our Native Americans were extremely spiritual people. They weren't Christian as we know it today, although a lot of them are now, uh, they were converted. But uh, at that time, they, would, they were mostly animistic type people that worshiped the elements. Uh, you remember the Plains tribes worshiped the buffalo and the sun. Well, the Hopis, uh, for instance, they worshiped the snake. Now, it's not that they thought that the snake was a great god. They actually thought that the snake was one of the lesser gods that lived below the world. Obviously, snakes live in the ground. They, you know, most of them have, you know, their dens in the, in the ground. But they thought that if they pleased the snake, that they would go into the underground and they would be able to do, take messages to the rain gods and rain would come upon their crops, which was vitally essential to them. And so they would do this. They would have snake dances. Now, this is a really good photograph of a couple of Hopi Indians dancing around. And you'll notice one of them does indeed have a snake in his mouth. The other one has a, a feather type thing, and he's, he's basically stroking the head of the snake, I'm sure, to try to keep it from biting the other guy. Um, most of the time, uh, these snakes were not poisonous, although the very bravest amongst them would use rattlesnakes. Um, I don't know about you, but it doesn't appeal to me by any means at all. But this is an example of how they would worship the natures of, of the things around them, in this case, the snake, to bring rain to them. Uh, the Pueblo tribes also had something that was probably the closest to a church that the American Indians had. The American Indians did not have any building they went to to worship their religion. They worshiped their religion outside. Uh, they, they thought that that was important to worship in nature. So they didn't have a building. The Pueblos had something they called a kiva. And a kiva was built as a worship type center and it was usually uh, a complex underground building you could only get access through it for a hole in the ground it usually had four different layers sig representing the stages in man's creation as, as they saw it and these kivas uh, became centers of, of activity for the pueblo tribes in fact the case uh, as the spanish and later the Americans uh, came into the Southwest and tried to bring the uh, Pueblo tribes under control. They began to outlaw these kivas and destroy them, which was a uh, really a, a not a very good thing to do because that really irritated the Indian more than it did help them convert them and make them uh, part of it. Uh, I have a picture of a kiva, which I absolutely love. And I think you can see why I like it. You'll notice here in the center of the Kiva, it has a swastika. Now you might think, what on earth is a Nazi symbol doing on the on the Kiva, a Navajo Kiva, in the middle of the desert in the 19th century? Well, folks, the swastika is an age-old symbol that's not uh, that that's not unique. It's found in many many civilizations and cultures throughout history. Uh, Hitler took the swastika and made it his brand as such. And, uh, you know, we would, we would say today that's his brand. And he made it a symbol for his Reich, his, his empire. And uh, it was not 
something unique to the Nazis. In fact, they were very late in using it, and they actually stole it from many other cultures, as you might say. So uh, I like that picture of the Kiva for that reason. They also had something they called Kachinas. Kachinas were supernatural beings. They were not gods. Uh, they were supernatural beings that lived up in the mountains. And they thought that the Kachinas would come down uh, every once in a while from the mountains in different parts of the seasons and stay with the people. And they thought it was very important that their children learn how to identify a kiva. So when they saw one, they would know what they were talking about. And so they built dolls of these things. They, they carved wooden dolls of the different types of kivas as they saw them. And these things, along with Indian masks from the Pueblo tribes, had become extremely collectible. And uh, this again is a photograph by uh, Curtis of some of the different kivas uh, that he was able to collect there and see. By the way, uh, here in Southwest Missouri, where I live, there, we're near Branson, and uh, Andy Williams, I'm sure some of you know who Andy Williams uh, was, had a theater in Branson. Some of you may have been there at one time or the other, and Andy Williams was a, a prolific collector of Navajo Indian blankets and uh, kachinas, and he had a vast collection of these in his uh, music venue and you could go there and he decorated his whole venue with West Southwestern tribe uh, blankets and kachinas and pottery. Uh, he had, and the collection was worth a fortune and when he died, uh, his family eventually ended up selling it off at public auction. Okay, uh, the other tribe in the Southwestern part of the United States at the time of the white man's arrival was the Apache. Now the Apache was totally different from either the Plains tribes or the Pueblo tribes. Uh, first of all, they were not herdsmen or planters, but they were nomads. They were hunters and gatherers, but actually folks, what they were, were marauders. They actually spent their time stealing stuff from the other tribes. Uh, they were prolific warriors. Uh, they usually uh, gathered in small bands of five to 10. They really had no uh, regimented governmental or religious structure to their tribe. They lived in brush covered, what they called wiki ups. And uh, they were extremely nomadic. And as I said, they lived on the other tribes. Uh, if they needed something, if they needed a horse, they would go steal it. If they needed food, they would go steal it. Now that doesn't mean they were bad people per se. It's just that's the life that they had. Uh, they, they did not live in a very good part of the country. Uh, the southwestern part where they lived in Arizona and New Mexico was extreme desert and they couldn't grow food and there wasn't a whole lot of livestock there. So they spent their time marauding uh, with other tribes. <clears throat> As a result, they developed into fierce warriors and uh, probably more than any other tribe in America, they gave the white man the most problems and and finally becoming uh they were so hostile that it took us a long time to get them under control and uh, the apache uh were just extreme warriors to such here's an example of an apache that curtis took a picture of you can see he's not real happy he probably wasn't real pleased about having his picture taken or being in a situation, I'm sure he was on a reservation at this time, and I'm sure that he wasn't happy about the whole situation. Uh, he would much rather be out on horseback riding around the desert. Now, the third area that we're gonna talk about, the fourth area, pardon me, is the Great Basin, that, that place between the Rocky Mountains and the Sierra Nevadas and the mountains up in the Northern Pacific Northwest, and the desert area. Uh, the basin was the high desert and it was extremely hospitable and arid. Um, it wasn't hot like the desert down in the south or around New Mexico and Arizona. It was actually pretty cool for the most part, but rain is very, very, uh, it, it, very minimal. You almost don't find any rain. There's no ground sources except for the Humboldt River. Uh, the Great Salt Lake, but of course the Great Salt Lake is not really uh, 
any kind of body of water that you can use as such. The result was that the Great Basin tribes really didn't progress much past the Neolithic Stone Age. Uh, there were pri primarily three tribes that we want to talk about out there, and I'm only going to talk about them very briefly. There, were, there was the Shoshone that lived up in the northern part of the Great Basin along the Stake River and up around uh, the edge of the Rocky Mountains. They were great horsemen. Uh, they, they were probably in some ways more akin to the Plains tribes, only they didn't have the buffalo. So they placed them out in the uh, Great Basin. The other areas, the other tribes that we're gonna mention are the Paiutes, uh, which were finally fi primarily found out in Nevada, and the Utes in Utah. Uh, and these folks, as I said, were really just not even hardly advanced past Neolithic Stone Age tribes. In fact, the case, uh, they lived a lot on digging up grubs and roots and stuff like this. This is how they, they primarily lived. They lived in extremely primitive shelters and the white man had a name for them, which uh, they don't like and I understand why. We call them diggers. Uh, and we call them this because that when we saw them, this seemed to be mostly what they were doing, were digging for roots and grubs to live off of. Uh, this is the Great Basin area. And you can see the Shoshone was primarily up here in the northern part. And in Utah, you have primarily the Utes. And out here, you did have some Shoshone, but also the Paiutes down in this area through here. Um, this is a photograph. Uh, I don't think this is a Curtis photograph, but this is a Paiute woman living uh, by her wiki up. And she's grinding some kind of nuts or berries or roots or something. Uh, you can just tell folks, they were, they were, the the poor men as such of the Indian tribes. Uh, I'm sure that some tribes fared better than others, but they uh, they did not do well. They, uh, they had a hard existence as such. Now, in comparison, the fifth area we're gonna talk about today is the California tribes. And the California tribes compared to the other tribes in America lived in a virtual Eden. Uh, it was just absolutely a wonderful land for them to live in. And compared to all the other tribes in the United States, except maybe the Pacific Northwest, they, they had just an extremely good location. The problem is it was pretty brittle. It was easily broken. Uh, the reason that it was so good, first of all, the climate, if you've ever lived in California, visited in California, you know for the most part it's very benign. Uh, it, it doesn't really get ever really, really cold. Uh, it can get really hot in some parts of California, but for the most part, particularly along the coast, uh, you get the, the Pacific Coast breezes. Uh, so it's really a, a very good climate to live in. On top of that, they had a lot of rain. They got a lot of snow melt off from the mountains. Uh, that nourished the land. Now, you might say, well, folks, that's not true. Look at all these fires that's going on out there. And, the re and you read all the time about how much uh, there's no water in the land to, uh, they have to irrigate the Central Valley and all this. <clears throat> well, that's true. But you got to remember something. We're talking about two or 300,000 Indians. Folks, you probably find two or 300,000 people in LA in a square mile. Uh, there were so many more people. There's so many more people there today. That's part of the problem uh, with the fires and the lack of water resources is that there's more people living in California than probably the land can sustain. We're talking about no more than two or 300,000 people, probably uh, about twice the size of my town where I'm living, Springfield, Missouri. Um, it just wasn't a very heavily populated area. And so they had plenty of resources as far as to be able to live off of. And they lived in a, they lived a very good life. They're, they had ample food, the plants, the animals were abundant. Uh, they had all the raw materials they needed for shelter, for clothing, for tools, for weapons. <clears throat> Pardon me while I take a drink. Excuse me. 
excuse me about that, sorry, my throat gets dry. Uh, and for all that reason, the tribes of the South of the uh, California tribes were very peaceful. They didn't need to go to war. They had nothing to fight for. Uh, there was plenty for everybody. And so nobody was really uh, very aggressive either to each other or to the white man. Um, unfortunately, that was their undoing because they were ill prepared for the arrival of the Spanish and then the Mexican and then the Americans. They just absolutely were not prepared for the arrival of these of these people that uh, were bound and determined to take over their land. Now, you can see here, this is a map of the California tribes, the major tribes, and, and folks, you've probably never heard of hardly any of these uh, because frankly, they were small uh, and there were probably hundreds of these tribes. They were very small bands of, of Indians that lived in, in a community. Um, you maybe have heard of some of them. Here's the Mojave Indians. I'll show you a Mojave girl in a few moments. And there's the Miwok. And uh, there's a there's a Pomo tribe. Uh, it's a rather well-known tribe. The Shasta up here in the northern part around the Shat Mount Shasta. But for the most part, the Indian tribes were, these California tribes were very small in bands of maybe 30 to 50 at the very most. Uh, this is where they lived. This is a typical California Indian tribe house. They really had no need for a lot of shelter. Again, uh, it just wasn't anything that, uh, you know, they lived in a rather benign uh, climate. Uh, and these were made out of like mats that they wove together. And you'll notice up here at the top, they have a hole where they could let the fire out. They probably had a fire inside here that they cooked on and all. And the smoke would come out here and then they could pull this over if it needed to, if it started raining or something. So uh, this was the type of house that they lived in. So, as I said, there were approximately two, maybe 250,000 Native Americans living along the California coast when, when the Spanish first arrived in California in the 1500s. Uh, they differed in size, they differed in appearance, they differed in language, government, religion. They just were extremely varied. Uh, they did hunt, they fished, they farmed. They just lived off the land in small, small simple villages. And uh, there was really, it was almost more of a, of a clannish type community rather than a tribe. I, I almost think back when I think of the Old Testament and the early clans uh, and the early families in the Bible uh, that were probably no more than 20 to 30 or 40. You know, uh, Abraham's tribe was extremely small when he when he left uh, Eden and came to uh, what we now know as Israel. Um, they were peaceful. They didn't wage war. Uh, the result was, folks, that when they were met with the white man, it was a disaster. To begin with, the Spanish, uh, who were the first ones there, uh, as you will find out next week if you listen in, the Spanish were hard taskmasters. They, uh, they were really, uh, they enslaved the tribes a lot. Uh, they outlawed their religious practices. They used them as slave laborers, I said. And the result was that they, uh, they had a whole different lifestyle once the Spanish came and then the Mexican followed them. And frankly, they were much better. And then we came along. And by that time, I'll be honest, a lot of the tribes had already gone into extinction and we didn't do anything to help that by any of the whole. Uh, by 1900, think about this. By 1900, there was an estimated less than 15,000 original California tribesmen left. Most of the tribes in the Southwest had disappeared, uh, pardon me, in California had disappeared. They were no longer there. Uh, there's one famous story about uh, a guy that came up out of the mountains, uh, I think around 1912, and he was trying to find some food and some people found him and they could tell that he was almost like a caveman. 
and he belonged to something called the Ishi tribe. And he was actually taken in by, I believe it was some uh, professors at Berkeley University, believe it or not. And they actually studied this guy for about five years. They, they learned his language. He demonstrated how he'd lived. He told them all about his history. And he was basically known as Ishii, the last of his people. Uh, unfortunately, Ishii suffered almost like every other Indian tribe in California. He died of tuberculosis. And this was, this was how the extinction came about. Famine, disease, uh, conquest. They were not prepared for the white man and their interaction with them uh, was just a, a terrible situation for them. And they basically went into extinction for all practical purposes. Now today, if you were to go to California, you will find a lot of Indians in California. They are not descendants of the original Indian tribes of California, for the most part. Uh, they may have some, but for the most part, these uh, Indian tribes in California are, have immigrated in, just like everyone else has in California. Uh, this is a Curtis photo of a Mojave girl in the late 1800s. I find this photo absolutely, uh, it just, it boggles my mind. I, when I first saw this photo, I thought that photo cannot be 130 years old. This girl cannot have lived 130 years ago. Uh, she looks as if she was walking down the streets of San Francisco or Los Angeles. Uh, it absolutely boggles my mind that this picture is that old. But uh, this would have been an example of what some of the California tribes look like. Uh, a very... Uh, unasiatic looking tribes, as you might say. Let's put it that way, okay? Um, finally, the fishing cultures of the Pacific Northwest. This is the last area that I want to talk about today. Um, and the fishing cultures of the Pacific Northwest was different from any of the other tribe areas that we talked about. The displaced Cherokee uh, primarily tried to assimilate in with the white man and as he was displaced into uh, Oklahoma along with the Choctaw and the Seminole and the Chickasha uh, and the Creek and as well as many other Indian tribes. Uh, the Plains tribes lived on the buffalo, were nomadic. Uh, they just, they uh, had a very complex religion and they were very much a peaceful people except amongst themselves and eventually amongst us. And then we talked today about the Southwestern tribes, again, that were, you had the Pueblo tribes were, uh, were agriculturally oriented, the Apache were marauders, and then the, the prehistoric tribes of the Great Basin. And then we just finished talking about the almost Eden-like tribes of California. The Northwestern coast tribes were nothing like any of those. Uh, again, and that's that's what I'm trying to get over to you, is that we have this stereotype that all Indians lived in teepees and rode horses and chased the buffalo. That was anything but true. That was that was not nearly the case. They made up, they were very diverse. And the coastal Indians of Pacific Northwest were some of the most diverse that existed. Uh, like the California tribes, their area was pretty much a paradise compared to some of the other areas. Other than their climate could be a lot, a little bit harsher, uh, could be much colder. Uh, you had a lot more snow that came in off the uh, the Cascade and the Klamath Mountains, and uh, you could have some pretty vicious storms come in off the Pacific Northwest, and uh, it does rain a lot up there. So they were a little bit different than any of the other tribes, but they developed a very sophisticated culture. They developed outstanding art. They had a flourishing economy. Uh, they were much more uh, outgoing than the California. The California tribes were very laid back. Uh, I don't know if that's where the current California people get it, but uh, they were laid back. They didn't, they didn't have the need to do a whole lot because Everything was there for them. The, uh, the fishing cultures of the Pacific Northwest were much, very much more active and sophisticated and uh, were actually did a lot more trading and uh, stuff like this. 
Now, they depended primarily upon the salmon. The salmon were prolific along the coast of the, uh, of the Pacific Northwest. And if you know anything about salmon migrations, they migrate primarily up the Columbia River. And they would catch these salmon in just, I mean, just thousands of them in nets or, uh, or what we call weirs, which was made up of woven stuff and they were like traps or they would, they would catch them with spears and they would dry it. And they lived off dried salmon for most of the year. And of course, this was terrific food. Uh, you know, everybody here is always trying to get me to eat more salmon. Unfortunately, I don't care much for the taste of salmon, but they say salmon is some of the best food in the world to eat. And uh, maybe that explains why the Pacific Northwest tribes were a little bit more active. Uh, uh, they also, of course, had opportunities to hunt big game up in the mountains. And they lived in a lot more substantial type housing. Uh, they did not live in, in teepees or they didn't live in mat houses or wiki ups or, or even a pueblo. They lived in uh, plank type houses, almost like wooden ha uh, cabins like we lived in in the beginning. Uh, this is where you can see most of the Pacific Northwest tribes. And again, some of these are not very familiar to us. Uh, the Tinglet tribe is fairly well known in the Haida tribe up in this area, the Chinook. Uh, and this goes all the way up into almost Alaska, really, in the, uh, till you get up into Inuits, uh, what we used to call Eskimos, and they're now called Inuit tribes. Uh, this is a photograph that, that Curtis took of a Tinglet man. And uh, you can see they let their hair grow long. They, were, uh, they grew more facial hair than most Indians did. Uh, they look a little fierce uh, because their religion, as I'm going to tell you about in a minute, was just a little bit sinister and dark as such. So let's look at their religion. Uh, most of the other Indian tribes looked upon their religion as being something to uh, get in harmony with. The Pacific Northwest tribes, they were almost more scared of their gods than worshipped them. They, uh, I'm, I'm kind of reminded in my mind, I used to study a lot of ancient history. And I remember the Greeks, the Greeks and the Romans always kind of thought their gods were playing games with them. If you know anything about Greek or Roman mythology, you know that there was always kind of this, they had tricksters almost. And they were the, they would play games with the humans down on earth. Well, I kind of get that feeling about the Pacific Northwest tribes that, that they really almost uh, were more scared of their gods than trying to worship and please them. So what they did, they would enact rituals designed to somehow please the gods and make them less uh, sinister to them. And they would reenact myths, uh, stories that they had heard throughout their life. For instance, in one tribe, uh, what they would do, they worship the bear, and the bear can be a ferocious animal, as you know, and a coming of age ritual for their boys, and this was very typical of most uh, primitive tribes were coming of age rituals uh, when they reached from, went from boyhood to manhood. Uh, the, some of the Indian tribes, some of the Pacific Northwest tribes would, would dress up in bear skins and when they come and capture the boys and take them out to the woods for several days and scare them and teach them how to be bears. Now the boys knew what were going on, but it still had to be a little bit scary, I'm sure. Um, and then after a few days, the rest of the tribe would gather up and go out and recapture the boys and bring them back and retrain them to be humans. Now, it all sounds silly to us, uh, but to them, this was a way that they were basically trying to placate the bear god. And this is typical of a lot of these Pacific Northwest tribes. This is a photo that Curtis took of a couple of these uh, people dressed up in bear skins, getting ready to capture some of the boys, getting ready to go into manhood and they would take them into the woods and train them how to be bears, ferocious animals as such. 
Um, it was just all part of their mythology. Now, as I said, the Pacific Northwest tribes were extremely good artisans. And uh, they were, they, they produced some of the most spectacular art of any of the tribes uh, found in America. Uh, every family had a crest uh, and they often centered their art around these, these crests. And they would actually build, they would take trees and carve them in the forms of their family representation and their gods. We know them as totem poles. And every village had totem poles in abundance. And uh, they would be placed in front of their houses. And they would be, in a sense, that they would tell the story of the family. It's almost like a genealogical type thing. In addition, they carved wooden masks. They worked in whalebone, scrimshaw. Uh, they, they just were prolific artisans as such. And the result is today that some of this artwork is just extremely extremely, extremely valuable. Again, uh, well, I thought I had it here. I was going to show you a picture of, uh, of something that I saw on the Antiques Roadshow. I must have lost it somehow, but I had a picture of a, of a wooden carved picture and also a little, and this was on Antiques Roadshow, and they look like something they look rather primitive, actually. You would think, you know, to look at them, it looks like something that maybe my grandfather would have carved. Uh, a little bit more elaborate than that, but not much. And these things were valued at well in excess of $150,000, $200,000 a piece. They're very valuable. If you can find wooden masks or totem poles from the old tribes, folks, these things are just invaluable. In fact, in case they're in museums, most of them. Um, now, the Pacific Northwest tribes did have one other very unique custom called potlatching. Uh, I had a hard time getting potlatching in my mind. I, I read about it and I thought, I don't understand this. I can't figure out exactly what they were trying to do. Uh, and what it, the way it was explained was that this would be how they would find out their rivalries. And they would, rather than actually have battles amongst the tribes, they would have almost like parties and they would divide their, invite their enemies and then the tribe would display all their wealth in front of them. And in order to see which one was the most important tribe, their enemies would have to display their wealth and whoever had the most wealth would be the superior tribe. They avoided a lot of bloodshed this way. And I thought to myself for a long time, I thought, I don't get this. I don't understand how this works. And then one day, as I was uh, working in the school that I worked in, and I, I taught school for 38 years, I walked by the trophy case and it hit me. I thought, we do the very same thing in schools. We display all these trophies for the visiting team as well as ourselves that come in to play a ball game or something. And they, the first thing they're met with is in the front hallway, almost every school is a trophy case. And we have all these trophies lined up and we're saying, look how important we are. We won the state championship here. We won this, we won that. What have you won? And when we go to their school, they do the same thing. And it, it kind of hit me how this works. And it was, a, it was a really something that was very difficult for me to get in my mind. And, and it wasn't until I actually looked one day at one of those trophy cases, it dawned on me exactly what potlatching was all about. Or at least I think that's what it was all about. Let's put it that way. Uh, and these potlatching ceremonies uh, took the form of lavish feasts and ceremonies. They would be uh, done during times of events like, uh, again, coming of age ceremonies or betrothals or weddings or funerals. Um, and the gifts basically were a display of wealth to see who was the most powerful tribe. Uh, when the British got into the Pacific Northwest and the British actually got there before anybody else, uh, they saw this much as uh, the Spanish saw Kivas as something to be outlawed. 
and they outlawed potlatching and folks it did not go over well with the tribes uh this was this was the most single most important thing they did and it really uh created a lot of morale problems uh with the tribes and it it created a lot of uh problems getting control of the tribes by the british they 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 lost a lot by doing that um uh, i think all these different european the americans the spanish the british the french the russians which were on the on the pacific northwest coast as well i think they all thought that they were basically trying to uh convert these tribes into christianity and you know there's a lesson to be learned here you need to convert by love not by force and uh it's something that i think it's taken a long time for a lot of people to understand and i don't know that everybody understands it yet today um this is again is a photograph by curtis of a wedding and you can see right in front of them they have a little bit of their wealth there uh, you can also see the totem poles back behind. These were carved out of trees. And you can see these things were just absolutely massive and beautiful. And they would have been vivid colors. Obviously, they're not colors now because this was in black and white. But they would have been painted vivid colors at the time. Um, so it was a, their artwork is just absolutely tremendous. And like I said, you, you won't find a lot of these. These have pretty well disappeared because, frankly, they were made out of wood and they brought it. Uh, they were out in the elements, and so they didn't last very long. So uh, I'm finished a little bit early today. I don't know about you, but here it's cold and windy and rainy, and it's not a very good day to be out anyway. Uh, so I always finish my presentation with a an idea of a movie to watch or a book to read because I. I'm a, I love movies and I like to read. Uh, as far as movies, uh, I think a good movie that kind of shows some of this area, uh, particularly in the Southwest, is The Searchers by John Wayne. Everybody loves John Wayne movies, you know. If you've never seen The Searchers, it's a really, really good movie. Uh, without giving a lot of the plot away, uh, the movie centers around John Wayne and, and uh, a young man searching for a niece who had been kidnapped by a tribe of Indians. And it takes like five years for them to finally find her. And uh, it's a very good movie. It's, it's filmed in Monument Valley in the southwestern part of the United States. It's absolutely a beautiful movie if you've never seen it. As far as books to read, uh, I read this book a few years ago by Mike Leach. Uh, it's about Geronimo, Leadership Strategies of an American Warrior. They studied Geronimo in the military academies. Geronimo was a great warrior, and we're going to hear more about Geronimo later in the in as we do our presentation as we get up into the Indian Wars. But uh, it's a really good book to read if you're interested in this type of thing. So, uh, like I said, I'm a little early today. Uh, I appreciate you attending and listening. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about the very earliest explorers into the western part of the United States, the Spanish and the French. The Spanish were here much earlier than any other group of people uh, of the Europeans that came into uh, North America and Central America. The French were not far behind them. They came from the north into Canada. So we're going to talk about the French and the Spanish explorers next week. And um, see what we can find out about them and then the next week after that we're going to see how we the americans got most of this area through purchase we purchased the louisiana purchase and we're going to talk about the lewis and clark core discovery and we're going to talk about their adventure for about two years exploring the western part of the united states so uh i appreciate it does uh anybody out there have any questions or anything that you'd like to ask Okay, uh, I believe we're done at this point, so Kaylin, I'm going to go ahead and uh, log off now. Thank you. It's good. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. There you. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
and there is a little bit of you there. Yeah, there's no 